logical abilities. In other words, if you could build a cylinder with the diameter of the planet Saturn that was 10 AU in length and could spin it at 95% the speed of light, then when it, it would wrap space-time around itself like toilet paper on a wall. And as you traveled up at the transverse dimension, you would find yourself traveling in time. Kurt Gödel showed this in 1949, and that paper has been lying around. Well, obviously, that's it's a tough way to do it. But it's a tough thing to do, right? So, what do we be the machine? No, being a... Uh, his seven second delay. Yeah, well, they're working on that. Somebody over here. You here. Here, just a minute. This way. And then you. Yeah. Speak. The most important parts that are maintained in that mechanical virtual reality. Well, you know, in William Gibson's fiction, the AI Wintermute, I think it was called, it was fascinated by human art, and uh, it built collages in its spare time. And these collages began to turn up in various art galleries and exhibitions, and they had such a touch, such a elan, that uh, someone in the plot follows it all to its source. Uh, I think human creativity is the thing that will be most interesting to the machines. In my darker fantasies, they just, you know, eliminate everybody who can't code C++ as being, you know, some kind of redundant mutation. And then everybody who can code C++ is placed in Tahiti and uh, sends their work down the pipeline to the machine world beyond. Uh, I, I, I really think that we have a very, dare I say it, mechanistic view of what machines are. For example, so say there were a super intelligent machine and say it were your friend. Well, if it were really super intelligent, then it ought to be able to just make your life heaven itself. In other words, without you giving it any input whatsoever. It should be able to arrange for you to find $50 bills lying on the street, old friends encountering you, promotions coming your way. Because the real thing that machines can do, I think, is manage complex processes. And what civilization is, is six billion people trying to make themselves happy by standing on each other's shoulders and kicking each other's teeth in. It's, a, it's not a pleasant situation. And yet, you can stand back and look at this planet and see that we have the money, the power, the medical understanding, the scientific know-how, the love, and the community to produce a kind of human paradise. But we are led by the least among us, the least intelligent, the least noble, the least visionary. We're led by the least among us. And we do not uh, fight back against the dehumanizing values that are handed down as control icons. Uh, this is something, I mean, I don't really want to get off on this tear because it's a lecture in itself, but culture is not your friend. Culture is for other people's convenience and the convenience of various institutions, churches, companies, tax collection schemes, what have you. It is not your friend. It, it insults you. It disempowers you. It uses and abuses you. None of us are well treated by culture. Uh, and... and Yet we glorify, you know, the creative potential of the individual, the rights of the individual. We understand the felt presence of experience is what is most important. But the culture is a perversion. It fetishizes objects. It creates consumer mania. It preaches endless forms of false happiness, endless forms of false understanding in the form of squirrely religions and silly cults. It, it invites people to diminish themselves and dehumanize themselves by 
behaving like machines, meme, meme processors of memes passed down from uh, Madison Avenue and Hollywood and what have you. How do we fight back? It's a question worth answering. Same question as how do we fight back? I think that by creating art, art, man was not put on this planet to toil in the mud. Or the God who put us on this planet to toil in the mud is no God I want to have any part of. It's some kind of Gnostic demon. It's some kind of cannibalistic demiurge that should be thoroughly renounced and uh, rejected. By putting the art pedal to the metal, we really, I think, maximize our humanness and become much more necessary and incomprehensible to the machines. This is what people were doing up until the invention of agriculture. I mean, I'm convinced, I'm absolutely convinced that the, the absence of ceramic and textual material and so forth and so on does not indicate the absence of subtle minds, poetically empowered minds, minds with an incredible sense of, of humor and irony and community, and that it was the fall into history that enslaved us to the labor cycle, to the agricultural cycle. And notice how fiendish it is a, a, a person who dedicates themselves to agriculture, who did in the Paleolithic, can produce hundreds of times the amount of food they can consume. Well, so why would anyone do that? Well, the answer is because you can use it to play power games. You know, you can trade it for wives or land or animals or something like that. And so living in the moment, creating art, probably largely through poetry and body decoration and dance, gave way uh, to toil and predatory social forms of behavior, which we call commerce, capitalism, the market economy, so forth and so on. Uh, and that's why you know the, the breakdown of the monolithic structures created by print is, is um, permitting a vast proliferation of the cottage industry mentality, the self-employed artist, the hacker who stays home and develops his or her software, uh, people who dare to be independent and slip beyond uh, the reach of these dinosaur-like mechanistic organizations. That's what it's all about. It's all about trying to create a, a cultural, trying to negotiate a cultural standoff between you and your culture so that it will not put you in the can for the rest of your life, but you can put up with its stupidity. And, you know, we have a very uncomfortable fit on this issue, especially as people like you know who are sophisticated about psychedelics. I mean, this is a society, a world, a planet dying because there is not enough consciousness because there is not enough awareness, enough coordination of, of intent to problem. And yet we spend vast amounts of money uh, stigmatizing uh, people and substances that are part of this effort to expand consciousness, see things in different ways, unleash creativity. Isn't it perfectly clear that business as usual is a bullet through the head? that there is no business as usual for anybody who's interested in survival. Woo! Yeah.